Hey Coda, in this video, I'm going to share with you all the behind the scenes learnings that I'm going through building my own desktop chatbot that can perform any task I ask it to, whether it's going to be dealing with all my email or whether it's going to be answering business related questions or writing code, putting code into files for me, etc. So this all started months ago when ChatGPT was absolutely exploding and we came up with this bot here called Rachel Chat. And Rachel Chat sounded something like this. We did a whole Udemy course on it. Hey, Rachel, did you see the first Matrix movie? Yes, Sean, I've seen it about a million times. We really need to find some new material to geek out over. Oh, definitely. What sort of uh, material have you got in mind, Rachel? What you've been looking at? The double slit experiment never ceases to amaze me. Particles behaving as waves and collapsing into a particle when observed. So the architecture of Rachel Chat looks something like this, right? You have a person who's using Rachel Chat and they will put in a request which will then get decoded. So when they speak, their speech will be translated to text, so speech to text. And that's done using the OpenAI Whisper API. And then they can get a response from ChatGPT. So that text is fed into another AI API request and ChatGPT gives a response. And then that response is encoded back into audio, into a human sounding voice using 11 Labs. So pretty basic, pretty straightforward stuff to build something which at the time was quite compelling and quite interesting. But now you'll notice here to the right, I have a chatbot that looks very, very different. And this here is what we will call just Jippity. Now Jippity, because if you follow the Prime Agents YouTube channel, you'll know that he calls it Chat Jippity. And so I've come up with this very posh speaking fellow named Jippity, who will not only be able to chat with me in real time, but Jippity will be able to perform tasks as well. Now, how can a chatbot go and perform tasks? Well, all we're doing is combining the ideas that we got here from this Rachel chat with building auto GPTs. And of course we learned to do that using Rust. So just as an example here, I could say, hi Jippity. And he'll do his usual and just provide some kind of response over here. And then I could say, I need a file with a Python function that prints yo man. And I'll just give him that task. And so Jippity will go off and tell me, yes, I'm working on it and start working on that actual task. So this is actually what I mean here when I say something that can actually go and perform a task as well as, you know, just chat with me. And so here I'm downloading this file. And if I go over here to my code and I bring in my downloads, you can see here is that file. This is where things get a bit more interesting. This is not good enough for me. This is frankly kind of boring because it just is expanding on tech we already know how to do. It doesn't help me improve much more as a developer. I'm trying to improve my own skills. And so the idea was rather than having to rely upon ChatGPT and 11 labs to go and build an auto GPT chatbot, can't we just make something that can work faster and cheaper on our own local machine? In other words, can I build a desktop application that will just run in the background forever listening to me speaking to it or if I want to, I can just type in a chat like over here. I could just say, you know, hi, Jippity, something like that. And it will respond instantaneously to me like, yeah. Ah, greeting, Sean. How delightful to hear from you. Pray, what brings you to my virtual doorstep today? In other words, it does it with personality. And you can see here, Jippity is not complete. I'm having to type to it right now. But the idea is... I want this thing to run on my own machine. I don't want to be spending money with ChatGPT every day. If I'm using this all day, every day, as I'm coding and running a business, etc., then I don't want to be having to pay money all day, every day to API providers like ChatGPT. Don't get me wrong, their tech is amazing. It's the best. GPT-4 is the best at the time of recording this. I use it every day and I love it. But if I'm going to be having a chatbot that is constantly coding for me, querying for me, giving me everything I need, dealing with my email. I don't want to be paying for all of those API requests, number one. Number two, I want there to be less latency. I want the answers to be instantaneous. And here's where I've run into some problems because how do you go from something 
like this, which is reliant upon all these third parties to something that looks more like this. It could be built in Rust. It could be built with whatever you want to build it with. I'm building it with Rust right now. But how do you go to something that looks more like this, where everything is run on your machine and you can share that desktop application with the world. I could share it with you. You could have it learn about you, learn about your emails on your own machine safely. And what I want to share with you right now is how for these first two parts of this workflow, i.e. decoding audio, then also classifying whether that audio or that request is related to a chat or a task, how I've been able to do that all just using Rust over here and not having to rely upon large language models either. So how do we go and do that? Because before what I would do is I would just pass a sentence to ChatGPT and say, you know, maybe use an AI function and say, hey, just classify this as chat or text. Well, there's actually a way to do that where you don't need to use large language models. And now we're gonna get into the world of training models with your own data and not just large language models because you don't need them. You don't always need a large language model. This is what I'm starting to really realize. The transformer architecture that makes up a large language model. So if we have a look at this architecture over here, this is the architecture. And don't worry if this is not familiar to you. If you want me to show you how to train your own transformer from scratch with your own data without having to download any large language models. I'll show you how to do that. But here we have this transformer architecture. We don't need the whole thing. We just need this encoder bit. And on top of that, we can just slap on a classification layer, i.e. it'll make a prediction. Is this a task or a chat, for example? And then it'll be told, slap on the wrist. No, you got it completely wrong go back and change all your brain connections, right? Do the back propagation, change all the weights for all the uh, neurons, essentially, that you've coded up over here and try again. And then it'll go through this process. And so you can train your own model and it's lightning fast. I mean, literally, I'm going to show it to you now. It will do this within split seconds. And it'll do it very quickly, which is much faster than sending OpenAI a request. So this part here, where we're now building our own transformers, seems to be very promising. The catch is you need to come up with the data. And I'll show you that that's what I've done. And then here, in terms of encoding or decoding, I should say, the audio, so speech to text, using Rust, I use the OpenAI Whisper download. So you can actually download an open source um, file for that and there's someone much smarter than me who did a lot of code that I just built upon to get that working. And so here is the Rust file over here that is working. And so essentially what it does is it loads the Whisper model from OpenAI and then it listens to a stream of audio constantly. This is looping all the time. It'll just constantly listen in, listen into the audio so someone doesn't have to press a record button. It will always be listening and be able to discern whether you're talking to it or not. And then once it goes and does that, it'll transcribe the speech to text. And once it's got that, it will send that to a function that will then go and perform an operation on that. And the operation that it performs is it'll take in that text and it will make a prediction whether or not the person is just having a chat or asking for a task to get done. So if we just go and run that, I'll show you what that looks like. Now, bear in mind, look how long it takes to load the model. And this is just a medium sized model from OpenAI Whisper. This is the model for decoding speech to text. Now I'm going to talk to the model now, as soon as it's ready, make me a website. How are you today? Okay, let me stop it here and let's take a look at this. So the first thing I said was make me a website and I had to speak very, very clearly. The reason I had to speak very clearly is I'm only using the medium sized model here from Whisper. And if you're wondering, for those of you who are Rust developers, I'm using the Whisper Burn. So just to show you what libraries I'm using here, I'm using Burn and Whisper. And there was somebody far smarter than me than, that wrote the base code for this. So this is the GitHub here. I'll put it in the description as well if you're interested. But just going back here to the code, what essentially is happening is 
this sentence is getting decoded, make me a website. And you can see here the prediction that this was a task was nearly 100%. Notice something else. You can go back and rewind the video if you want to for this. This literally got predicted within split seconds. There was no open AI call to ChatGPT to say, can you classify this as a task or a chat? None of that. It's split seconds. This is a task. This person is asking for you to build them a website. And then here you, we have the how are you today with an extra how on the end. Again, I'm using the medium size here and there's also some uh, tweaking I have to do with how I'm buffering the audio coming in and then when I'm decoding it. So there's some massaging still needed there. But nonetheless, what it's now doing is saying, no, this is just a conversation. This is just a chat. And so how did I know that, or how did the model know? How does this system know if it's not using Llama 2 or some large language model, ChatGPT or anything, how does it know whether this is a task being asked for here or a chat being asked for here? Well, up here in, in this library here, which I'm calling multi-head for what's known as a multi-headed attention, all it is is this here. It's this transformer here. It's the encoder part of this with a classifier strapped to the end of it. So if you don't know about neural networks and you want me to cover that, I'm happy to do a video on how to build using Rust, a deep learning model yourself that trains on your own data that doesn't require a large language model to understand sentences, right? It can just use this encoder and, and then classify sentences based on the data that you train it on. But this is essentially what it's doing is I've got this data here with a bunch of sentences. What's your name? What's your favorite movie? You know. Um, make my bed, whatever it is. And then it classifies whether this is a chat or a task operation. And so I give it this data over here and it's learning based on that data. And how is it doing that? Well, actually all the credit for this goes in terms of the library that it's using goes to this DFDX library. So this is a deep learning library for Rust. It is fantastic. It works extremely well. I've given it something quite challenging to do here as well. And I was able to learn and figure this out, you know, just using their example code. And it took me about a day. There were a lot of things that I was doing wrong and I wasn't understanding. It took me about a day, but I managed to get this working for this basic setup. And so what it's doing here is we're building a sentiment model and you do this using just a type, you know, type, call it whatever you want. And the first layer is an embedding layer. The second layer, layer is this transformer encoder and then a linear layer out. And you'll notice here is the feed forward process. So for those of you who are used to working with Python and training you know, models using PyTorch or whatever, the logic here will be familiar to you. If you're not used to Rust, then this might look a bit stupid and crazy to you. And that's absolutely fine. It still looks stupid and crazy to me, by the way. But this makes sense. What's happening is you're feeding your data forward through the model, through the different layers. And then I've got this, you know, what's known as a pooling layer here before I then go and uh, get the prediction it's making and then correct it and do what's known as back propagation to correct what it's thinking. So this model gets trained and then it gets saved. And then once it's saved, there's a function that's getting called here by the actual chatbot, which loads the model and then makes a prediction. So here the model's loading and it goes and essentially passes a sentence into that model and gives me the prediction on whether or not this is a chat or a task operation. And so my point here is by training your own model. So just going back to this, right? Let's go back to this diagram here. We don't have to rely on large language models for everything. The technology that they're built with is already phenomenal. The transformer architecture in and of itself is worth studying and understanding in detail. It's really worth your time in understanding that because from my experience, you can use it for this text classification, sentiment prediction, or you could use it for finance or a lot of things. There's a lot of applications, but out of everything I'm building here, this is what worked the fastest split seconds to make that decision. And so I would say anytime you're building a chatbot, whether you're doing it in Rust or Python or whatever you're doing it in JavaScript, you know, Zig, whatever it is, it's worth where you have decision trees, training up your own models. 
in terms of training up your own Llama 2 to actually write the code or, you know, provide the large language model responses that we do need from a large language model, I'm not here yet. And the reason I'm not here yet is because I don't believe we have the, or generally speaking, in society, we have the hardware locally to run these things fast and efficiently. Like right now, I'm on an M1 Mac. It's the base M1 Mac. I got it not long after it came out. And this M1 Mac, you saw how long it took just to load the Whisper model. That's just for decoding text. So right now, my vision of Jeopardy running on a desktop, running fast, is not viable. And I think there's people that probably who do watch these videos or might watch this video on this channel who are a lot more experienced than me. And they might have some feedback on how that performance could be extracted out of you know any machine or any machine's hardware. But from my experience, it's actually just not at that point. So I think to get a real realistic sounding chatbot right now, I might have to concede here on 11 labs because 11 labs is right now the only solution that I can find that gives you that performance in terms of a realistic sounding voice back. And then in terms of the actual chatbot functions here, you know, again, we're talking about GPD-4. So that's gonna have to go, that's going, that's going, that's going. You'd, you'd still have to work with GPD-4 uh, on these or GPD-3.5 if it's just chat, you know, that's happening. So those are my thoughts. That's my experience. These are, you know, some of the libraries I'm working with. This is some of the vision that I have for these chatbots and what I want for me personally going forward. I don't know how that helps you. I hope it helps some of you. And until the next one, take care and talk soon.